Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar on treatment of waste electric and electronic equipment. Good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you are finding us. My name is Nila Kapp and I'm a waste management expert working at UN Habitat. And I have the honor to lead you through today's program. Before we start, a few housekeeping rules. Please put your questions, and I hope you have a lot of them, into the Q&A uh, part. There's uh, a part on your right side where it says Q&A. Please also include whom the question is directed, but address it to all panelists. Use the chat for general remarks if you want to comment on anything that was said or on some of the what was mentioned. This webinar will be recorded, and I'm, it's already in process, so I'm informing you of that, and we hope that we can try to share the slides with you afterwards. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Wuppertal Institute for Environment, Climate, Energy, and Youth Habitat under the Urban Pathways Project, which is financed by the German Federal Ministry for the So good morning, everybody. Nelly is having some uh, problems with the connection. So I will uh, continue the, the agenda that she was uh, just introducing you. So today's webinar is brought to you by the Wuppertal Institute for Environment, Climate, Energy, and New Inhabitat under the Urban Pathways Project, which is financed by the German Vendor Federal Ministry for the Environment under the International Climate Initiative. In the project, we cooperate with cities in the Global South to implement activities in the areas of sustainable mobility, energy, and waste management. The aim of the project is to contribute to the climate targets, the SDG, and the new urban agenda. We also organize capacity building and exchange of good practice because we believe that we can all learn a lot from each other. Uh, why today's webinar? So the webinar series on organic waste management. Hi, Nelly. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened. Okay, perfect. Then I'll just start there. So <laughs> we're talking today about treatment of uh, e-waste because it's International E-Waste Day. And 2019, 53.6 million metric tons of electronic waste uh, was generated worldwide. This number increased actually by 21% in just five years, according to the Global E-Waste Monitor, um, which I want, want to share later in the, in, in the chat. However, only 17.4% of this e-waste was recycled, and the whereabouts of the rest are actually undocumented. So it's very probably that they were not treated in an environmentally sound way. So today, we want to change that by hearing from two practitioners in Kenya and Brazil about what kind of e-waste they receive, how they treat it, and what they do with the output. But we want to hear from our audience. So we prepared a poll for you with two questions at this moment. And I'm kind of asking uh, Adriana to open the poll. And because we want to hear from you. Okay. Um, while we're figuring out the problems that we're also having with the polls, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I'll just go ahead and um, introduce our first, our first uh, guest. So we can afterwards go back to learning more also about you. So our first speaker is uh, Risa Mora, and she's an enthusiastic youth and environmental steward with experience in e-waste management in Kenya. Her background is in energy and environmental engineering, and she currently heads the WE Center's recycling operations aimed at ensuring the actualization of the new circular economy in waste management in Africa. Risa, the former Miss Environment Kenya 2015-16, Passionate about, uh, passionate about environment and its protection for a sustainable future. Risa, we are really looking forward to hearing from you, and we will make you the presenter now. So you, you can already see you. That's nice. You can unmute yourself. And then you can also share your screen. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great.
You will let me know once you can be able to see my screen. We can see it. You can start. Thank you. Awesome. So welcome again to everyone to today's webinar and happy International E-Waste Day. So I won't introduce myself again because Nelly, you've already done that. I'll just dive into the presentation. So um, I will start by now definition of we or e-waste. We all know it as any item that is electrical or electronic that has reached end of life or has been overtaken by technology or you no longer need it maybe in your house or in your office. Um, one other thing that you might have not known that uh, is important to know is that we have different streams of waste which are displayed on your screen. We have small IT equipment, we have um, small equipment which are mainly from your household, things like uh, fans and cameras and calculators. Then we have large equipment, these are things floor printers and the ovens that you might have in your house. And then we have screens. So the screens are majorly the large screens, computers and TVs and laptops, but not necessarily the phones because they're very small and you see they fall under small IT equipment. Then we have fifth category, which is lamps. So any type of bulb or lighting equipment falls under the lamp category. Then the last one is the temperature ex exchange which is anything that gives off heat or anything that cools, whatever that, that uh, you'd want to be cooled off. So those are the six major e-waste streams that we have. And for any type of e-waste that you have, must fall under one of the, the streams that are presented on your screen. Sorry. So now I will just give a very, very brief history before I dive into uh, the deeper part of this. About the WE Center, we are the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Center. And we started first as a department under a company called CFSK, which is our mother company, an NGO that distributes computers to learning institutions for purposes of learning, of course, and teaching. And um, we were legally registered as a limited liability company in 2012. And from then up to today, we have processed about over 10,000 tons of e-waste is what we have safely recycled and have also avoided about 14,000 um, uh, carbon, carbon dioxide emissions. We've avoided those from going into the atmosphere. So the main achievements that we have are multiple awards from NEMA and also CIO 100, as well as um, being ISO certified on both um, environment and quality management. And our main commitment when it comes to um, the SDGs, we majorly contribute to SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities, SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production, as well as SDG 17 on partnerships to achieve all the goals that we have. And also we are committed to ensuring that all the processes that we follow adhere to the highest standards internationally so that we protect both the environment and human health in all aspects of it all. And to also contribute to that, we are licensed by NEMA. That is the National Environment Management Authority here in, in Kenya. And we are also focusing a lot, a lot on making sure that we reduce whatever carbon dioxide emissions that might be brought about by improper disposal of e-waste. So these are things that you probably you will get to understand more as I move on with the presentation. So an overview is what we have now on your screen of um, the statistics we have when it comes to e-waste management. So right now we have um, over 50 million tons of e-waste that are being produced worldwide, which is quite a lot. It's quite a lot because um, we, 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 we always have this big appetite of buying a new phone when your old one is broken or buying a new phone when your, old, when your old one has been overtaken by technology. So that means that we produce so much of it and either store or dump it instead of properly recycling. So we have about 20% of this being properly collected and recycled and the rest of it is either now being burned, being trashed with the rest of, of, of 
the waste that we have or just being kept in the stores. And um, as per the 2019 statistics, we have e-waste that um, we can get about 3.2 billion um, US dollars from if we properly um, manage all of it. But if we are only managing about 20% of that, it means we're losing a lot of value. We're losing a lot of value and there's a lot of pollution that comes out of not being able or rather not really handling all that in a proper, in a proper manner. So, when it comes down to now the processes that we have, focusing mainly on Kenya, the region that um, we work in, all the six categories we're able to collect through the collection points that we have in the country. We have these collection points in collaboration with a number of partners. We have over a hundred of them, not only in Nairobi, but in eight different regions in the country. And we collect from those points as well as corporates, learning institutions, NGOs, and international agencies and firms. Then now of all the processes that I'm about to go through, this is a representation of what we're aiming at. As you know, the whole world is moving from now the linear economy where you just take a product, consume and dispose without really trying to understand where it goes after that. Now we are moving into a new phase, so to say, of taking a product and designing it in a way that it will be recyclable or it will be very easy to repair. And then once it enters into the market, the producer can be, the consumer can be able to use it after they are tired of it, they can take it for repair and then someone else can reuse before we take it for disposal. So what we usually say at the WE Center is that disposal is normally the last, the very, very last option to take because it's usually the most expensive option. So even before disposal, we always make sure that whatever you can repair, you repair and repurpose, you upcycle or you refurbish or whatever you can do before you can take whatever components can no longer be used or reused for recycling. So in general, what this model is, is that whatever resource we have, we make sure it is used over and over and over again without having to dispose it and without having to go back to the mines to get new raw materials. And this is what it looks like on the ground. Um, the first, the first uh, step, of course, is to now collect whatever e-waste we have and then take inventory of the waste. Then the next stage is to disassemble. We do exactly the opposite of what the manufacturers would do. Whatever they put together, we take apart and get different fractions from it. You'll find we have batteries, we have plastic, we have metal, we have cables, we have all sorts of things that come out of there. Then we move to the next stage where we sort and test those equipment so that now we can either recycle whatever fraction it is, or we can repurpose, or we can refurbish, depending on, on what product it is. And this I will demonstrate as we move um, deeper into the presentation. Then once we find that there are material that we cannot process, we take them to the next stage that we call final disposition. And this is where now everything is destroyed because it cannot be reused or, or, or repurposed or repaired or refurbished. Then after that, we have the last stage of my, uh, remanufacturing. This is now for the um, materials that we have extracted that are considered to be raw materials. For something new. So for example, if you have phosphor powder, for example, from CRTs, once it's now in that powder form, it goes directly to remanufacturing other things. And then now after remanufacturing, we get back to the consumer being able to buy the product again and it joins the cycle. Then um, this is now the, I think, one of the most interesting parts that I find everyone ex being excited about. And it also excites me as well. This is where we process every single thing that we receive after taking inventory of this waste. So because we have to be accountable to anyone who disposes of uh, their waste, we have to make sure we record every single thing that comes to the center for us to be able to report back to whoever might have disposed, whether an individual or a company or a school, to let them know this is what you have disposed and this is what you did to whatever you have, you have disposed with us. So under the general e-waste, we start first by disassembly and sorting. And this is what I was explaining earlier, that we take whatever um, electronics into different 
pieces such as motherboards, we separate and get batteries, we, we also get metal, we get plastic, we get all components into different fractions. Before now we can do other processing of the same. What you're seeing on your screen is an example um, of a laptop. So in case you have never seen what a laptop looks like inside, you, you have it on the screen. Then the next one is a CRT TV or a CRT monitor. For this very new generation, I am sure there are some of us who hadn't ever interacted with the CRT TV or monitor before, and this is what it looks like. So the inside part of it, as you can see, also has a lot, a lot of components that have to be either upcycled, recycled, um, or taken for final disposition. I will take you through step by step on what exactly you're seeing on the screen, what is useful and what is harmful to environment and also to, to human health. Looking at the left side of your screen, um, you can see we have a, a lot of plastic on this, and this is now the outer casing of the computer. Whatever you see when you're watching TV, whether it is gray or black, is, is plastic, is purely plastic. Then the front part of the screen, which is what you see when you're watching TV, is glass. And behind that glass is a grayish looking powder. I don't know if you can see when I'm, when I'm using my, my mouse to demonstrate all that. Um, so just behind that screen is that powder, which can be harmful when it is left to go into environment or if you touch it um, with your own hands. So to avoid this getting to environment, we have a machine called the CRT cutter, which you can see on the right side of, of, of the screen now. This is one of our technicians now breaking the glass into two pieces, the back part or the top part from the, from the bottom part. So once that has been opened up, the bottom, from the bottom part, we extract now the phosphorus from them, which, goes, uh, which we export as a resource to make new material. Then the glass we crush and mix it with other material to make caverns or anything that we put on our clothes. Then coming back to the left side of the screen, you can see we have some motherboards at the bottom of, of, of our TV here. And we also have another board at the back at the back of the computer. So these ones are also resourceful because now we get some minerals from this, some, some precious metal from this, and those go back into the chain as resources to make either new electronics or to make other products that might need something like um gold and the likes so the next one is plastic and metal i've decided to put these ones together because they're pretty easy to to explain on plastic we usually um shred it and then um make plastic fencing poles we also make tables we make outdoor furniture and we also partner in with a company that extracts diesel from the plastic so that one I think is pretty straightforward and with the plastic recycling industry being very, very out there, I think a lot of us might understand exactly what happens in there. So the products that we have are, as I have mentioned. Then on metal, we just sort, because we have different types of metal that come. We have um, aluminum, we have copper, we have zinc and the likes. So we sort them and then they go for smelting to make new material as well. Then um, when it comes to cables, there's a huge, huge problem that we have seen happening, not just in Kenya, but also in some parts of West Africa, whereby people in the informal sector, so to say, burn these cables to extract copper from it. Because as we all know, copper is very vulnerable. And this is one of the ways in which they um, make business or put bread on the table, so to say. So this is what we really discourage to burn anything just to get uh, value out of it or just to just in the name of recycling. So what we did is also now to get a um, specific machine to extract copper from all the cables that, that have copper inside. So the machine just strips the cables open and then we now extract manually the plastic from the copper. So the copper is very valuable. We make jewelry out of it. And we also have um, some people who buy it to make other things out of it. Then when it comes to batteries, we receive 
all types of batteries from lithium ion batteries to lead acid to nickel cadmium to the button cell batteries to the alkaline batteries that you find in in in, in your remote controls and also um, laptop batteries and phone batteries. So we have quite a range of, 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 of these. And what we do at our center, when we receive these uh, batteries, we first take inventory of them like any other waste, and then we move to the stage of sorting. So the purpose of sorting is to ensure that all batteries are kept in their uh, specific chemical families. When we store these batteries, we have to make sure that they are not mixed up to minimize on any chances of them causing a fire because they are one of the most dangerous types of um, e-waste to keep because you never know, they might just um, spark a fire at any time and it can be quite dangerous, especially when they are mixed up. So we sort these batteries and um, for the lithium ion batteries specifically, we are able to sort them and test to see which batteries can still be charged and recharged so that we can make new battery packs. And that is what you're seeing on the first line on, on, on your screen. The first part of it with the blue, the blue looking things are the lithium ion batteries. The second part of it that has equipment, this is now our testing line where we test whether these batteries are in good condition to be reused. And on the third one where we have the Solaron, we call it a Solaron. It's one of the products that we have. Um, we make this now for the market. You can be able to use this for lighting in your house. You can be able to um, use it to power devices that are, are, are for solar and so on and so forth. And the goodness we have with these batteries is that whenever they face any malfunctions, you can always bring them back and we'll be able to um, open them up, test the cells again, and then let you know which one is not working. You replace the ones that are no longer functioning, and then you have it back and you can use it for at least three to five years. And if it's well maintained, you can use it for more than that. So this is how we now repurpose the lithium ion batteries instead of disposing them when we get them at the center. And these are mainly gotten from solar equipment, by the way. Then on the second line down here, we have the lead acid batteries. Um, as you may know, lead acid batteries are very expensive. They can be quite expensive. And for companies that usually use this lead acid batteries, it is much cheaper to have repurposed batteries. And when one disposes these batteries, it's not always that they are completely not working. So we are able to test these batteries and classify them according to now their different capacities, um, repurpose them or rather refurbish them and then bring them back to you so that you can use them for at least another three years or so before they can need to be finally disposed because they are not working anymore. So this is what we do with batteries and I think so far we've been working quite well with them and we're also transitioning into contributing to the sector of e-mobility especially with the lithium ion batteries because they have proven to be the strongest when it comes the strongest and the most reliable when it comes to them being fitted into motorcycles and also being fitted into vehicles that um, are running on solar so we're looking forward to a very exciting journey when it comes to e-mobility and um, we have quite a number of partners on this to to, to move with it then on the ICT equipment majorly, that is the printers, computers, and laptops. We refurbish this for purposes of learning um, in learning institutions. And we do this in partnership with our mother organization, Confucius for Schools Kenya, which is an NGO. So we receive different types of computers, then we test them to see which ones meet the minimum standards of use when it comes to them being taken to schools. So um, we refurbish this and then clean them and install genuine software um, so that they can be taken to schools for purposes of teaching and also for purposes of learning. And as we know now, we're moving into um, the virtual world whereby students, some of them um, learn from home, there are some that are in school, but they still need to understand how to use a computer. And these computers are then taken to schools that might have otherwise not been able to interact with the computer before. So we're able to help them with the computers, maintain them every single year so that they can use them for another maybe five years, 
and some go even up to 10 years of use um, once, once they have been refurbished and well maintained. So um, this is now what we have done so far when it comes to reuse of the computers. We have eight regions, like I have mentioned, and we have distributed over 450,000 um, devices so far. And this has benefited over 4 million beneficiaries in the country, both in, pri in primary and high school, as well as community centers and, uni and some universities as well. And then, um, we have also trained them and have recycled them e waste from that. Then I'm almost finishing. So the one of the last things is now from the assorted components, we now make jewelry and art out of this waste, which is another um, very big opportunity for youth who are interested in art as well. Then when it comes to data safety, every single equipment that we receive, we must take it through um, data wiping or degaussing or wiping through or, or physical destruction of whatever uh, carries the, the data so whatever we cannot process locally we have partnered with a number of companies in europe that uh, take this equipment through final disposition that follow the highest standards uh, for those that we do not have in africa and we are present in 15 african countries through partners actively and directly managing our facilities in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. So I've come to the end of the presentation and I would like to invite any questions, if there are any, Nelly. Thank you, Risa, for the very interesting insight in the work of the WEAS centers. I think also very inspiring what you saw, said, especially in the beginning about the circular economy. I think um the we center can for for a lot of other countries that are so in the so-called developed world um about and learning something from you about the circular economy so thank you for this and um i will now go over to open the poll to see if that will work and we will co uh, come back to you reserve with some questions maybe later so thank you for the meantime and so now uh do you the poll and I hope this now works and <laughs> you can all um, our questions. We are, want to know from you which sectors you are from. So if you're national or regional government, municipality, NGO, private sector, academia or other. So please um, just say what you're from and also please enter us what do you think is the biggest fraction of e-waste globally. So, Risa already gave you a good overview about the different fractions of e-waste, so I don't have to explain anymore what they are. But um, uh, we're just interested, what do you think, what is the biggest fraction globally? I'm also going to tell you afterwards what it is. <laughs> so, I'll just wait. While you're uh, making up your mind, I'm going to introduce our next, our next um, panelist who is Andre Silvera, and he is the Business and Operations Manager at Synctronics, and with more than 25 years of experience in the electronics and technology industry. He has worked for companies such as Chromon, GE, IBM, Electron, Motorola, and Flexotronics. Andre graduated in electrical engineering from Unicamp Brazil, is postgraduate in business administration from FGV, and holds a master in sustainable development from the Imperial College London. So, Andre, get ready to deliver your presentation while I'm closing the poll and this will take some time. So, once it's closed, now I want to share the results with you. And um, as you can see, the most people that entered are part of the private sector, actually, the third of our uh, of the people who responded, but there are also people who say they are from other organizations. And the most people think small equipment is um, the most abandoned around the world, followed by all the others, which are the same um, amount. 
And now I am very excited to say that you are all very knowledgeable about this because this is actually true because small equipment is the total most like the total amount of small equipment is actually the most around the world. So now I am giving the word to Andre for his presentation and I'm looking forward to that one. Andre, if you want to share your video and unmute yourself and also share your screen, we would be happy. Okay, okay. So first of all, thanks for 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 an invitation in this uh, very important webinar. I'm very happy to 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 share here what we have been doing here in at Centronics in Brazil, and also happy with the opportunity to learn with uh, all the team here in in this webinar. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let me share. The, the presentation here. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Just one second. Okay. Okay, so first, uh, as uh, explained by Neil here, we have this, this scenario about the e-waste, a lot of uh, 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 e-waste generated every year and growing year uh, after year, and only 17% is being collected or at least registered, uh, what is uh, uh, very low. You know, in Brazil, we are around uh, one and two percent of uh, e-waste collected. So we still have a lot of uh, uh, challenges and a lot of opportunities to, to, to improve this. Okay, just, just coping with the same uh, uh, view as planned before. And here is uh, what we know that we need to do. We need to move from the linear economy to the circular economy and uh, uh, Stop this this growing of your waste and and all all and get all the, the benefits that you can get from the circular economy, as as uh, Neil and and Rita has have already explained it here. So we are very focused on uh, sustainability and circular economy, <clears throat> and now we are going to show what we have been doing here in the in the past years. So with Centronics, uh, we. Uh, we are a center for innovation and technology for sustainability and circular economy. Okay, we are located in São Paulo, Brazil, and we are part of uh, the Flextronics uh, group. That is a manufacturing is a global manufacturing company that is presented in more than 30 countries, with more than 130 factories around the world. Okay, so we are uh, we are part of the, the Flextronics group. And here is uh, the, the the environment, the the, the 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 ecosystem that we have in Brazil with Flex. So we have uh, an innovation center that is a that is an R and D center that do search and develop and circular economy. We also have a, a manufacturing facilities. We have three manufacturing facilities in Brazil that we and we also have post manufacturing services. And then we have in the right here, we have a Syntronics that is a, a building dedicated for first logistics and uh, sustainability and circular economy. Okay, and uh, uh, talking about the 
that we have at Centronics. The first one is uh, the, what we call sustainable reverse logistics. We have established a, a, a system that covers the entire country. We have uh, more than 500 vehicles and more than 450 collection points uh, distributed around the country. So we, we have all this, we have a system that uh, we can track all 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 the all the calls that we receive from our customers from all the all the collection points we have an online systems we have a, a data security for all all the equipments that we collect and we also work with a lot of campaigns for reverse logistics uh, we also have inside Syntronics uh, what we call sustainable recycling that is a focus on circular economy. So everything starts when we receive the equipment from the reverse logistics, then we do an incoming screening, then we do the dismantling and separation. Then we separate all the materials all in raw materials, and then we send these materials back to the supply chain of each uh, type of material, so uh, metals, uh, plastic, uh, rubber, whatever. All the materials we separate and we send to to the to the industry that will reuse all these raw materials again. And is specifically talking about the, the plastics that we got that we get from the electronic equipments. We we have an internal uh, infrastructure to recycle uh, the, the resins. And then we use this uh, recycled resins to, to, to produce uh, new equipment. So we use these uh, resins to build new printers, new computers, and then we close the loop in the circular economy. So, so for the plastics, we do a, a closed loop for circular economy where we use the same, the same plastics that we collect from the field, we disassemble, we recycle, and we build new products with the same plastic. So the plastic uh, 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 cycling here inside the system. So we have this for the plastics, and for the other materials, we we do the proper the, the proper destination to the specific industries. Uh, some numbers that we have here. Uh, about Syntronics, we have uh, collected more than 11k tons of uh, e-waste. We have recycled more than 2k tons of uh, plastics, uh, avoided more than 2k tons of CO2s, and uh, uh, almost 22k of watts of uh, in more than 600 jobs. And we also work with uh, several uh, social and education programs. So some illustrations here that we have in our process for the reverse logistics. Here, a picture of our uh, internal operation. Here, a picture of our uh, dismantling line, showing all the, the equip electronic equipments that we receive, and then we start all the, dis the dismantling process. Uh, here is a machine, uh, an auto automatic uh, machine that we disassemble and separate the materials, we separate uh, plastics from metals. So this is this is an automated uh, machine that is uh, very useful when we process a lot of uh, uh, when we process big volumes of equipments. We have this uh, washing machine that we use to to wash uh, uh, white plastics when you are going before we do the recycling. When we receive the plastics from the field, it usually comes with some 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 dirt, some labels, some some type of material that needs to be uh, cleaned or removed. So we have this material to to get a better quality of the the plastic uh, when we start the the recycling process. Then we have the recycling itself. This is the the machine that does the extrusion of of the plastics. So this is uh, generating new new resins, new recycled resins. 
Here are, is some examples of uh, uh, products that we do with the recycled resins. In the left here, we, we do some, some piece parts for the packing of printers. In the right side, uh, the, the bag, one bag of our uh, recycled resins that we send back to the market. Some pallets that we do using plastics and also an example of uh, parts that we build using recycled parts that that we build new products with them. Another example is uh, as you have a manufacturing facility in 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 uh, in the same in the same site, we reuse all the plastics that are uh, uh, qualified for for the products, and then we we recycle it plastics and reuse again for the manufacturing products. There are some examples of the, 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 the savings in energy and savings in CO2 emissions that we have when we recycle the, the plastics. The, the, the main plastics recycle from e-waste are ABS and HIPS. So we have a, a good savings in, in energy and emissions when we when we compare with uh, virgin materials. So this is a this is a good contribution that we have for the environment when we have this recycling process. And here is is a map showing uh, all the materials that we receive and uh, uh, disassemble from the electronic e equipments. And, and and what we do with uh, which one of them. So we in the left here, we have uh, uh, plastics, we have uh, carton boxes and cushions, and and uh, and styrofoam. That for this this tree we do a recycling and we reuse that in the same uh, in the same process to build new products or to build new packing or to. Build uh, uh, question, for example. So for this tree, we have a closed loop uh, for the circular economy, so we can use that. For the others, for metals, uh, steel, metals, aluminium, copper, uh, uh, salts, and 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 some uh, woods, we 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 have developed uh, what we call a sustainable source. That it's uh, a, we call sustainable sourcing, but it's more like a, a sustainable destination. So we have the bad developer uh, partners that have the capabilities to recycle all this type of materials, or in some cases, do the the, the destination, the, the 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 proper destination. In some case, that they, it's not possible to reuse the material. So we have this is the map of all the materials that we receive and we recycle or do the, the proper destination. Here are some uh, equipment we have you know, to, for, for data security. One is for the material identification because we receive uh, uh, different types of plastics, so we, we cannot mix them. So we, so we have some equipment to do the identification. <clears throat> And so we have a, a, a lab with uh, that can uh, do some measurements in the plastics to to measure the quality and all the characteristics of the plastics. Here is our uh, uh, quality control and and lab, our lab that we do all the measurements and. Uh, Uh, this is one example of one uh, 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 one printer that we build using recycled resin. So all this all these parts here, we 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 use recycled plastics to build new products. So we are talking about uh, in, uh, in last year, we used 400 tons of recycled plastics for for this on this part here for this specific printer. We also have a, a similar uh, uh, 
initiative as, as Rita mentioned with the IT equipments that are in end of use, that are in end of life. So we do the reuse and refurbish. So all the, all the equipments that we can uh, recover, we can use, we can uh, use them and, and, and as with the, the, the concept as a product, as a service, we can rent, for example or we can use in, in social programs and social projects for education and any other type of social projects. And the equipments that we cannot recover, we, we do the recycling internally at Syntronic. So this is one, one capability that, that we have also. Here are some examples of some products <clears throat> that, we, that we build with the material that we generated internally. So we have some trash cans, we have some kitchen accessories, bouquets, uh, food tray, and uh, a light fixer that we have uh, developed with, of, with all, the, all the materials that we generated from the e-waste. So very, very interesting examples of what you can do using the, the material that otherwise would go to the landfill. This is one very interesting uh, project that we are working, that uh, what we do, we, we are getting uh, specific parts, uh, specific from printers, that we have a lot of uh, uh, motors, a lot of uh, uh, mechanical parts, electronic parts that can be reused. So instead of uh, uh, doing the disposition or destroying them, we, 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 we separate from from the equipment and we build some kits and then we ship these kits for schools for for robotics training so it's very very interesting we that that we, we can do this and for some uh, schools that don't have this uh, alternative or this possibility uh, for for robotics training so we are doing this and we are contributing for the education of the country uh, very good use of the material that we receive. And here are some uh, examples of uh, awards and certifications that we have received since the 2013 when we started the, the operation. So we have received some, some national awards and some international awards. Uh, important here and we are very proud of that and uh, some important certification I just would like to mention here this one zero waste is a certification that uh, uh, that certified that our factory uh, does not send anything to the landfill so every every waste that is uh, generated inside the manufacturing process we give a proper disposition where we do the recycling or we do a partner that will do the recycling or the, 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 proper, the proper destination. And uh, no material is sent to the landfill. So this is one very important uh, uh, certification that I'm very proud of. And also the R2 uh, certification that is for responsible recycling. That is also very important. It's it's, it's uh, uh, growing here in Brazil. We are the first company that 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 got the certification, and it's really really very important. So we are uh, very proud of all the awards and certifications, and and and, and the high standard of of the the services that that we provide. And that's it. That's a little bit about the history of uh, Syntronix. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'm here if you have any questions, uh, discussions. Uh, and, and again, thank you for the, for the invitation and the participation. Uh, DeAndre, thank you for this very impressive um, presentation. I think we saw this as a bit of another thing than what Rita explained to us, but somehow they have the same components, it's just on a different scale, and it's also nice to see that it's embedded into the manufacturing process, I think. So we are now um, going into our round of questions. I'm also asking Risa to come on board again to share her video so we can see the both of you. 
and to get our audience to get ready to ask their questions. In the meanwhile, I am also still opening our last, we have another poll for you, sorry. I want to engage the audience as well. I'm just going to click, you can see it on your right side, and you can just um, answer if there is any formal e-waste treatment in your like treatment center, in your city, yes, no, or not sure. You have uh, like half a minute time to answer this, and we're looking forward to that. And as we still have 15 minutes, I would like to use the opportunity to engage a bit with the audience. So if anyone in the audience has a question, please just raise your hand. There is on the, if you go on the top, open the participants um, panel. You can have or have on the lower right hand the possibility to raise your hand. And uh, this way you can actually say that you have a question and we will then give you the possibility to ask it. So maybe, um, Adriana, can you please unmute your key? I think uh, I was the first one to have a question to put it in the chat and this way the question can just be asked. So your key, you have the possibility to uh, ask your question now. You're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I have a question for uh, to Andre. Um, so as we know, uh, electronics do have heavy metals inside. I'm sorry if I missed this during your presentation, but um, in when in the e-waste, um, I would say treatment process, do heavy metal uh, treatment take place, and what's the process for that? Thank you. Okay, Yarki, thanks for your question. Uh, okay, from EOA, we separate from uh, uh, from iron and and uh, iron type of metals. For for iron, we 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 have uh, some companies that that build iron, so they receive the iron and then they do the recycling process for the iron. And then they uh, uh, resell the iron again to their customers. So this is what you do for the iron. Minion is is very similar. We have companies that have the capabilities to do the recycling process. So we collect, we separate all the aluminium, and then we we send to these companies. So they they melt the aluminium and do the recycling process, and then they sell again to the to the market to the industries. Uh, the same for 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 the copper. For the copper, in fact, we sell to a company that uses the copper to build uh, uh, new PCBs. So uh, it's it's not a close the loop because we don't do it internally. But this this company will close will 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 use the copper again to build PCBs. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the metals that are either the PCBs and PCBAs. So for these ones, there there is uh, it's necessary a, a very uh, how would say very high technology to do that. We don't have this technology in 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 Latin America. To some companies to that have that that they they have the process or have partnerships with other companies that are capable to extract the the golden the the. The platinum and and all the procedures uh, metals from the PCBAs, and uh, I think these are the the main metals. I don't know if I answered your question or if you have any questions specific about any type of metal. Adriana, can you give Yorki again the word to see if the answer was uh, question was answered? Yorki, you're unmuted. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you, Andre, for your uh, answer. Actually, I just just made one one follow up question about um, chromium and you know other uh, heavy metal elements. Um, I understand that uh, those elements are uh, in you in electronics. So how do you treat those kind of uh, those uh, elements? This for. Also, if there is, uh, uh, for example, in, in, in monitors, we, we have companies that are need, needs to separate all the, the, the 
metals that can that can uh, cause any any pollution to the to the environment and in the in the pcbs uh, we, we we know that we that there is a, a ros uh, directive that has uh, uh, banished the some some type of metals but some very old some very old uh, uh, metals that are present in some of very old PCBs before uh, year uh, 90s and, and, and 80s. Then uh, the, the same company that will do the, the, the recycling of the PCBAs, they also need to separate these this, this materials and do the, the, the proper destination and use of these heavy metals. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Perfect. Then we will go to Gabriel, who had a question a bit, uh, along some other lines. So, if we unmute Gabriel to ask uh, his question, you're unmuted, Gabriel. Okay, thank you. Uh, this for for everyone who would like to to answer. Uh, well, we noticed that it's possible to recycle this this electronic material. And it's even pro profitable, uh, but it's not treated. Uh, it's not. Uh, there's not enough work uh, worldwide uh, on this. How can uh, what is needed uh, to improve this mentality to spread these more uh, worldwide? Thank you. Maybe Risa, you have some thoughts on this. How can we change the mentality of of people, of entrepreneurs, to go into e-waste recycling? What was uh, how how did the V Center start this? Who started this? What was the driver behind it? Yes, um, I will agree very much to the fact that uh, there's not really enough being done at this point because a lot of people with this electronics are not aware that there's something called e-waste recycling or e-waste in the first place. So awareness creation is definitely one of um, the major things that have to be done and to be done very well. Um, and this can only be done also in partnership with governments because they also have quite a large reach and also a very large impact um, when it comes to that. And there's also the second bit of having government enforcing laws and regulations that um, tap into that issue of having to not necessarily force, but having to oblige people to proper disposal of e-waste through things like extended producer responsibility. And once that such kind of things are in place, then we would have much better um, re outreach and also disposal rates, in my opinion. I hope that that answers the question. Let's see. Maybe um, Andre has also some thoughts on this, or wants to add on this. Uh, yes, yes. In, in in my view, we we have uh, two uh, two big challenges. One is to change the mindset, uh, and help to move from the linear economy to a circular economy to be more sustainable, to move towards sustainable development. And this is related to education. So uh, you know, um, this is a long journey and, and if and this is the first step. If we don't have this 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 education, this mindset, this view in all the sectors of our societies, uh, it will be difficult to 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 achieve this this objective of sustainability so this is one thing another thing that i see that is important is a, a kind of motivation that we need to have in the in the society to to improve the 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 the, the e-waste treatment uh, it can be uh, some types of laws some incentives some uh, uh, regulations, whatever it can can be related with government or not, but we must have an, a motivation that uh, will 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 make all all the partners, all the stakeholders, 
uh, work together to 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 treat the 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 UAs, the, all the consumers, the distributors, the producers, the importers, all the stakeholders. They must have a motivation to make uh, this this thing happen, from the reverse logistics to the recycling and reuse. So. This is also important and, uh, and, and, and a challenge for, for all the countries. Okay, thank you, Risa and Andre, for your words. Gabriel, do you have any follow up on this? You're unmuted. No, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. I think it's a, it's a big challenge, but it's, it's okay. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think everyone agrees with you. <laughs> so before we go to uh, Joe, who was the next in line with a question, I just wanted to highlight shortly the answer, the poll that we did. So actually, most of the respondents said that they have a formal e-waste treatment in their city, which is a bit surprising for me at least. And uh, only a third says they don't have, and a uh, few are not sure about it. So I just wanted to to highlight this. So next one up in with a question is Joe. You are unmuted. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning or afternoon to everyone. Uh, so the question would be for Andre. Uh, I'm based in Ecuador. Uh, we are an e-waste recycler as well, R2 as well. Uh, and I was thinking about the question was regarding um, regional integration because you know Brazil is huge. Brazil has a, a lot of manufacturing. Whereas other countries such as Ecuador and uh, I don't know Peru, Bolivia, we do not have the same capabilities. This circular uh, economy approach is a bit more difficult since we don't have that kind of uh, infrastructure. So the question is regarding uh, integration: how open or how you see integration in terms of uh, region, in terms of Latin America? How open are you or willing to? Um, work with another researchers in the region which are pretty much having the same issues and the same solutions. Okay, Joe, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, uh, yes, Brazil is, is very huge. We it's it's a, and and as you and as you saw in the beginning we, we are still around one and two percent of uh, of all the e waste that we're recycling only so we are big but we are still uh, still in the first stage so we don't have a very big uh, network uh, working in in, in other country we have some some important players like us in, in the country. We also have uh, uh, an initiative that is uh, a group of of many uh, manufacturers, of many electronic manufacturers that they have an association, and uh, they will contribute with this associate association in a monthly fee, and <coughs> this association will be responsible to create the the national network for the e-waste recycling. We have a, a, a national policy in Brazil that took place, that is effective uh, from uh, one, two years ago. And we have targets to improve this up to 20% in, 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 in the next years. So uh, this association is, is a good example that can be uh, used for any, any country because it it doesn't depend on the government. So it's only the, the private sector, the manufacturers that are responsible to generate the, the, the great majority of the, 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 the waste that we have in the country. So they have this association and they will, the, 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 the goal is to grow up this, this network and get uh, uh, a lot of cities, a lot of uh, all the states, all the cities, and get much more uh, representative in the percentage of the recycling. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, ah, okay, perfect. <laughs> then we have one last hand up, I'm seeing, and we still have time to take this one. So, Tessa, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, uh, Nella, and thanks very much, uh, Rita and Andre, for very interesting presentation and very laudable initiatives. Um, and thanks also for uh, referring to the burning of plastic as a sort of very inappropriate measure 
um, especially because of the uh, uh, persistent organic pollutants that then are freed up, which are causing cancer, dioxins in particular. Um, so I, I had a same question as, as Gabriel. So thanks very much for answering that on what you see as key policy measures, regulatory measures, or other measures to boost the industry and the e-way. So um, I had two other questions. Um, Rita, you mentioned that disposal um, is the most expensive process, but I assume that's only when you have uh, markets for your uh, recycled materials. Um, so can you expand a little bit on that and um, uh, when the, you say plastic industry is out there, uh, are the chips mainly exported or are you dealing nationally with it? And um, if you know, uh, are you also affected in that regard uh, by uh, um, kind of the, the, the regulations on um, uh, uh, transboundary movements? Um, and then, uh, Andre, uh, since you're also an innovation center, um, what are your views on, on blockchain? Um, for tracing hazardous substances. Um, is this something that also could greatly foster circularity and, and ease uh, recycling? Um, so, yeah, thanks in advance for, for your views. Thank you. Okay, Rita, are you able to take uh, to start on this one? I'm not sure if you're still with us because the connection says you're if you're still there, you would have to unmute. Otherwise, oh yeah, please. Mm, okay, maybe Andre, you can start and see if Risa comes back and joins us again to answer a question. Thank you. Yes, 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 uh, Tessa. We 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 have a, we have a, a a lot of innovation in our uh, in our daily operations, and uh, yes, I believe I, I think blockchain is a is a good opportunity. Because uh, we are, there is a lot of uh, tracking involved in in the real waste. If we find a way, track all the equipments. Imagine we could track every single uh, electronic equipment since the beginning, where they start the manufacturing, until they go to the distributors, until they go to the stores, and go to the final users and then go to a recycling center if you are able to track all this uh, and, and showing that uh, uh, the one that is is with the equipment at that moment is the one responsible for that equipment and when you pass to someone it you you need this will be recorded somewhere for example in a blockchain so this would be recorded that uh, you have an, uh, a cell phone, for example, that you still didn't uh, proceed with any kind of disposal or you didn't send to any store that we're going to recover or uh, refurbish that. So uh, I think blockchain, we have a good opportunity to, to explore this uh, tracking of the uh, electronic equipments. Okay, and I'm seeing Larissa is back with us. Risa, did you yes. get such a question? I think I got part of it and then it drops off. Okay. Um, um, maybe Tessa, can you, re or, or you want to start, uh, or do you think you can enter it? The bit that I heard, or maybe she can summarize again. Sure. Tessa, please. Yeah, sorry, uh, Rita. Um, uh, I was asking you. You mentioned that disposal is the most expensive process, and and I was just um, uh, saying. I assume that you then uh, have a market for your uh, recyclates. So um, can you expand a little bit uh, on that? Because uh, it would be interesting to understand the the finances um, side of things as well as some of uh, the the steps will really involve costs. And then when you ha say there's plastic industry out there, um, are you then referring to the national um, um, users or is most of the uh, plastic chipping uh, exported? Yes, um, so now when we say now recycling becomes the most expensive option, it's in the region at this point, there are some material that we have to export. And the cost of that shipment and some of the cost of treatment all lies back to us, the recycler in, 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 in Kenya, for example. 
So you find that even whatever other income generating streams um, have to cater for that expense of shipment and also treatment of, of that. So it becomes more expensive than being able to repurpose or to upcycle uh, some of the material to something else or to reuse. So it becomes expensive in that sense. But had we had um, a treatment facility in the country or just nearby, it would be much cheaper. Great. Well, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are at the end of our time, and I'm also seeing. I think there are no more hands up. So thank you so much, Risa. Thank you so much, Andre, for sharing with us your experiences. Thank you to the audience for participating in the question. And um, for the plaza, go for the plaza. With our maps. panelists. Uh, and yeah, for the plaza. Leon, you're, you're, you, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. <laughs> and I'm sorry for this. And I'm sorry for the disturbances in the beginning. As always, this happens, of course, if we're online. And I posted some additional resources in the chat. There's also, for example, a webinar series, which is focusing even more on details than we did today. So maybe some of the attendees want to check this out. And um, yes, yeah, thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day, evening, morning, midday, wherever you are. And um, we're looking forward to maybe to engage on another time on another topic. We will continue the series uh, with the deep dives and we'll probably go again a little bit into organic waste management. But uh, we're happy that we had this very interesting topic today on e-waste. Thank you so much.